I know what time it is. It's 1127 right now. But two or three months ago, God laid this on my heart. I'm not even going to dismiss the kids right now. Do you understand how important you are to the kingdom of God? Do you understand that when you were baptized in Jesus' name, what took place in your life? Next month, I will, Sister Bishop and I will have been married for 40 years. It's a long time. It's a long time. I remember that day very well. She and I got in an argument that day. We did. But I will tell you this right now. When I came out of that side prayer room with those men who were with me and my pastor, and we walked up there, and he made the statement, who giveth this woman to be married to this man? And her father said, her mother and I, but she wouldn't take on my last name. We wouldn't be married for 40 years. We would not. Because that day she was no longer called Janetta K. Barrett. From that day, she was called Janetta K. Bishop. Because she took on my name at that point. And four months ago, I could tell you where I was when God gave me the title of this message. And I probably won't get through it. But I want to preach to you on what's in a name. What's in a name. Book of Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. There are many life-changing examples in the Word of God. Jesus used simple parables or short stories to get a point across to convey a message. And he used those stories that his audience was familiar with. And on many occasions, Jesus answered a question by asking a question. So this morning, for just a little while, I want to start out by asking a question. This is the question. What is your name what importance is your name what is the purpose of your name what does your name do you see names identify us Webster's dictionary says that a name is the distinctive dis uh, designation of a person or a thing your name is what separates one person from one thing or from something this something from that something I look across this congregation today, and when I was putting this together, I got to thinking of certain things. What does the name Ruth mean? It means friendship or compassion. What about Naomi? It means pleasant. What about Michael? It means he who resembles God. What about Paul? It means small or humble. Daniel? It means God is my judge. Ichabod means the spirit of the Lord has departed. Jabez means born in sorrow. David means beloved of the Lord. Trevor means large settlement. Andrew means manly, brave, and strong. Alex means defender. Brian means noble. Annalyn means God has favored me or I am now complete. The word Peter means rock or stone. The word Anne means grace. The word carol means song of praise. I look around this congregation. I pulled out certain names on purpose. Because in my mind, some of the people that I just made mention of, that is exactly what I see them as. Sister Ann, when I looked up your name, I went, that is so her. An individual that's full of grace. So kind. Always a pleasant word. Our name means something. My father used to say this to me, a good name. 
The phrase a good name is an expression in many languages and for many centuries because your name is automatically associated with your reputation. In the New Living Translation, that very same verse that I began with says this, Choose a good reputation over great riches, for being held in high esteem is better than having silver and gold. I sat down with my district superintendent, I think it was back in May, maybe April, when we were having our sectional meetings, and he looked at me, and we were sitting there having a bite to eat in Sacramento right after the service, and he looked at me, and this is what he said. I've heard this before from other individuals. They said, Brother Bishop, if I was to give you two words that describe you, here's the two words that it would be, loyal and faithful. Loyal and faithful. Some people may not like that. They want to be known as a camp meeting or a conference preacher. I don't. My favorite place to preach is right here. It is right here. Always has been. Always will be. They want to be known as this or that or something else. But let me tell you what the Bible says. Moreover, it is required of stewards to be found faithful. I'd rather be found faithful than talented. I'd rather be found faithful than anything else in the world. Why? Because God honors faithfulness. But that's what my reputation to somebody was. Then again, if I start naming names right now like Lucifer and Je Jezebel and Adolf Hitler and Billy Graham and Mother Teresa, all of a sudden things start coming into our mind because their reputation precedes them, and that's how we look at them. What you are cannot be separated from what your name is once they are identified together. That's why in the Bible when somebody changed their character, God gave them a new name. When they changed their character, God gave them a new name. Abram was called Abraham. And Jacob was called Israel. And Sarai was called Sarah. And Simon was called Peter the Rock. In addition to our reputation, your name also represents your authority. When a police officer stops, and Sister Souther and I were talking about this the other day at Grace. And she made a statement, and I put it in my notes because I felt like it was so impactful. She said, when a police officer stops you, he doesn't stop you in his name. He doesn't stop you in his name. And that is true. He stops you in the name of the law because he has an authority because he's part of that law. If a man by the name of John Smith calls me at dinner time, I might not answer the phone. But if an elder of this church calls me at dinner time, I'm going to pick up the phone and say, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. How can I help you? Why? Because they have authority. They've helped to mold who I am as a person. When someone has authority but no reputation, they have power but no character, it results in a misuse of their name and their position. I have a question. It's this. Would you work for this company? It has over 300 employees and the following statistics. 30 have been accused of spousal abuse. 9 have been arrested for fraud. 14 have been accused of writing bad checks. 95 have directly or indirectly bankrupt at least two businesses. 4 have done time for assault. 55 cannot get a credit card due to bad credit. 12 have been arrested on drug-related charges. Four have been arrested for shoplifting. 16 are currently defending lawsuits. 62 have been arrested for drunk driving in the last year. Can you guess what this organization is? You're pretty close to Congress of the United States of America, but it's not our Congress, actually. It's actually the 301 members of the Canadian Parliament, the people who write Canada's laws. But I don't think that would be too far from Congress. Everything that Jesus touched, everything that Jesus touched, he utterly transformed. He touched time when he was born into the world. 
He had a birthday, and that birthday utterly altered the way we measure time. Now, the, the whole world counts time as B.C. or before Christ, or A.D. in the year of our Lord. Isn't it ironic that the most arrogant atheist writing a letter to a friend must acknowledge that Jesus Christ altered everything when he dates that letter? The resurrection of Jesus is unique among all world religions. Hear me. Confucius died and was buried. Tao died and he wandered off in the wilderness and died with his water buffalo. Buddha rotted from food poisoning. Muhammad died in A.D. 632 and his body was cut up and spread all over the Middle East. But Jesus died and this is what he said before he was crucified. Crucify this body, bury this body, and in three days I'll raise it up again. They thought he was talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his own temple, the temple of himself. He said, bury me and I promise you this, I won't stay in the tomb. Bury me and I promise you this, I'll roll that thing away because in three days, I'll come out of it. He's the only one who ever rose from the dead. He's the only one who came out of death, hell, and the grave and was victorious. Jesus Christ. No other name has the authority that Jesus has. Other re religions promise heaven and they are writing a blank check they may have a reputation, but they have no authority. Only Jesus has that authority. In the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, neither is there salvation in any other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4 and 12, there, it says it this way in the New Living Translation. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name in all of heaven for people to call on the name and be saved. What's in a name? In the Old Testament, Isaiah prophesied of this coming Savior in Isaiah 7 and 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. You need to look at that. Shall call his name Emmanuel. If Mary's son was called Emmanuel, why did she call him Jesus? Because this means the same thing. Emmanuel means God with us, and Jesus means Jehovah saves. Where God dwells, God saves. And there are people that are in here this morning, and you've been baptized in Jesus' name, and you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, but it's not just being baptized in Jesus' name. When you got baptized in Jesus' name, you got buried with him in baptism to rise in newness of life. You have authority in your life because you have the name of Jesus applied to your life. Wherever Jesus dwells, he brings salvation. The list is endless. He walks into the, underneath the tree and looks up and says, come on down today, Zacchaeus, because we're having lunch today. Blind Bartimaeus starts crying, and Jesus stops everything. He looks at a tomb that Lazarus is in and says, Lazarus, come forth. He touches Mary Magdalene, full of devils, demoniac from, Gadar from the Gadarenes, the Samaritan woman at the well, Matthew the tax collector, the widow's son of Nain, the sermon, servant of the Roman centurion, the woman with the issue of blood, ten lepers, the blind, the deaf, the lame. The list is endless. Everywhere that Jesus went, Jesus was touching somebody and transforming their lives. What's in name? Here's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. What are his qualifications, and what is his resume? Personality? Perfectly balanced. He's wonderful. Education, knows all things. He's the counselor. Nationality, rules all nations. He's the mighty God. Work experience, creator. He's the everlasting father. And skills, reconciliation, he's the prince of peace. Nobody else can do what Jesus has done. Nobody else has ever done what Jesus has done. What's in a name? Well, where do we use the authority of this name? I'm glad that you ask. 
Because this is not just for a bunch of preachers standing behind a pulpit who get excited because of what God has done in my life. People look at me sometimes, Pastor, why is it that you get so excited? You didn't know me when Jesus saved me. You didn't know me when everybody else walked away from me. You didn't know me when they stuck me in the back of a church that was supposed to love and nurture me. You didn't know me when I was an alcoholic. You didn't know me when I was on my last dime. You didn't know me when I was walking in the, in, in the gutters picking up pop bottles for, 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 for money to go get a haircut. You didn't know me when I was shoveling out manure in a, in, a, in a horse stall just to eat. But Jesus did. But Jesus did. He knew exactly where I was. And when I got baptized in Jesus' name at, a chi- at the age of nine years old as a child, something transformed in my life. And that's what I want to finish this message about this morning. I got 15 minutes, and I'm, I'm, I'm plowing through it. But here it is, right here. You've been baptized in Jesus' name. I want you to raise your hand. Just raise it, right? Most of you have been baptized in Jesus' name. Why? Because there's no other name, Acts chapter 4, given among men whereby we must be saved. Nobody was ever baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the New Testament. It's not there. If you find it, I'll give you $1,000, but it's not there. They were always baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or in Jesus' name. That's how they were baptized. The mode of baptism was changed at the Council of Nicaea when they started baptizing the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Jesus never said to baptize in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He was talking about the descriptive names in Matthew 28, 19 of what the Father was. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus said. Talking about the Son, Matthew 1, 21. He looked at Mary, and the angel looked at Mary and said, Thou shalt have a son, and call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And the book of John, chapter 14, talking about the comforter. He said, The comforter, I send the comforter in my name. I don't leave you comfortless, but I send it in my name. And in the book of Revelation, who are you going to see sitting on the throne? There's not three gods. There's one God, and his name is Jesus Christ. That's what's in a name. There's power in a name. When we pray, book of John chapter 14, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. We talk about and we preach about the name. Old Brother Urshan used to make a statement. He used to say this to a bunch of young preachers. He said, if you don't have anything else to preach, preach Jesus. You don't have anything else to preach, Preach Jesus, because Jesus is who saves you. A fast song doesn't save you. A nice building doesn't save you. Big bank accounts don't don't save you. Jesus' name is what saves you. In Luke 4, 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Why is it that we preach a lot of things But sometimes we don't bring Jesus into it. I'll take my glasses off. That way I don't see you very well. Because some people look at me sideways right now. We know how to shout. We know how to do a lot of things. But I'm going to tell you what. If that shout don't lead you to Jesus, and that Bible study don't lead you to Jesus, and that song don't lead you to Jesus at the foot of the cross, then why are we doing it? Because the song can't save you. Believe it or not, the Bible study can't save you. And, and, the, and the shout can't save you. But when you start preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified and what he did at Calvary, it'll bring people to the altar. Now I'll put my glasses back on. When people are healed and they receive their healing... Acts 3 and 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I have none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I don't have a lot to offer you. I don't. I got bills just like everybody else. But what I do have will absolutely change your life. 
And it's not what I have, it's who he is. And his name is Jesus Christ. And if you come to an altar today, or don't even come to an altar, but you stand right where you're at, and you lift your hands to heaven, I promise you, God will push all of heaven and hell aside to come right to where you're at. Maybe this is your first time in a Pentecostal church, and you're saying, man, that preacher's crazy. No, you haven't seen the half of it yet, sisters, brother. You haven't seen nothing yet, because I know what God's done in my life. I know what God's done in my life, and I can't sit there and patty cake for Jesus when I know what God's done and how he delivered my life. I didn't even like who I was. Never mind everybody else. Like I said, Sister Bishop and I have been married 40 years next month, but when she met me, she didn't even like me. Tell the truth. She thought I was stuck up. You want to know what's going on? Let me tell you what's going on. I was trying to put on something that I wasn't. I was trying to make everybody think that I was something that I wasn't because when I walked into a Bible college, I was beat up. I was hurt. I was destitute. I needed something that that college was able to give me that I couldn't find on my own. I needed Jesus in a way that was more than just going to the altar at that point. I needed a lifestyle saying, okay, this is how you do it. And a lady wouldn't give up on me. A little bitty short lady, white hair, by the name of Olive Haney. She would never give up on me. When I wanted to quit, she'd grab me by the collar and say, why don't you finish something that you start? You quit everything you do. And she made me mad. And when I graduated after four years, she hooded me, not some theologian that was standing up there. That old white-haired lady hooded me at that point, and she whispered in my ear, Brother Angel, I knew you could do it. You'll change the world someday. You'll change the world someday. And I am looking at individuals here tonight, this morning rather, and I'm here to tell you, you'll change the world someday, but you got to get a hold of this. What's in a name? When you were baptized in Jesus' name, you took on the authority of what came with that name. It's not time for you to sit in the shadows. It's time for you to boldly go forth proclaiming the name that washed away your sins. People call me all week long and say, Pastor, such and such is in the hospital. I can't heal them, Brother Tabios. You can't heal them. But I can tell you this, when you walk into that room in confidence and authority because you've been baptized in the name of Jesus and you walk in that authority, I come in the name of Jesus Christ and I lay hands on them. All of a sudden, God walks into the room. I looked at the group of individuals after the meeting last night, and this is what I said to them. I said, when I pray, God answers. I don't know about you, but Papa, when I pray, I'm not being arrogant or facetious or braggadocious, but I know this right now. When Pastor Bishop prays, God answers. He may not answer the way I want him to answer right then, he may say no. He may say yes. He just sometimes, Brother Ron, will look at me and say, just wait. Because God's taking care of a bunch of things up here. And I'm praying right here. And God's dealing with all this up here right now. Can he do it? Yeah, he's God. And Sometimes he's looking at me saying, wait, because there's some things he's wanting to put inside of me or things he's wanting to take out of me. When I walk into a hospital, I walk in there in confidence knowing that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. And when I lay my hand on somebody's head, I'm expecting all of heaven to come down in that room. Why? Because I walk in the power and the authority of the name of Jesus. And if you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in his name, then why are you slinking into the shadows when God has given you the authority and the power that he's given every other individual? Why? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Sister Bracken, if you'd come, please. When people come to get the Holy Ghost, I'm going to say something right here. It may just cross swords with you. I'm not meaning to do that, but I can prove it by Scripture. I sat down at 6 o'clock every morning in Maryland with my friend. 
And I looked at my friend, and I said, friend, the Holy Ghost is not the gospel. And I thought he was going to choke on his coffee. And he said, what did you just say? I said, the Holy Ghost is not the gospel. I said, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when people preach the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it brings conviction into people's hearts. And if you read the book of Acts, around chapter 3 and chapter 4, they came to Peter in chapter 2, and they said, what do I need to do to be saved? We only stop at Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to those who are far off, and even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Verse 39. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When they looked at the apostle Peter, Peter said, he that you crucified is both Lord and Christ. You crucified an innocent man. And everybody walks away from him at the cross except one, John. John stays with him. Everybody else flees. Why is it that we're afraid to preach about the cross? Why is it that we're afraid to preach about the blood? Why is it that we're afraid to preach about resurrection except on Easter? Because we want to preach about something that will make people shout. Because we think if we make them shout, then we've had good church. I like to shout just as much as the next person. And I wasn't letting a bunch of young people in, in Maryland out shout a 60-year-old man. That wasn't happening. You might have had to cart me out in a, in a stretcher, but it wasn't happening. Because sometimes we think church is over because we've shouted. Church is not over until every last individual obeys the gospel and comes to an altar. And the results of the gospel is that they get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and they get baptized in Jesus' name. That's the results of the gospel. The results of the gospel is people being filled with God's Spirit. And I did something out there that I did here not long ago. And I'll never forget it. I brought two chairs right down here. And Brother Carl got the baptism of the Holy Ghost sitting right there. Right there. Brother Carl, I'll never forget that as long as I live. I remember Brother Dan being over your left shoulder. And all of a sudden... Sister Judy being there and Amber being there and Sam being there. And everybody walks away. And it's almost like God says, okay, now I can do what I need to do. And everybody walked away. And I'm standing right here. And I'm watching. And I'm saying, he's speaking in tongues. Sister Amber got down and listened. And sure enough, Brother Carl was speaking in tongues. Well, I did something out there. I preached a message out there. You've heard me preach it. But I felt led of the Holy Ghost to preach this message. It was entitled, Catch the Wave. And when I got done preaching that message, I was going to give a generic altar call, and the Lord just spoke to my spirit and said, No, you're not. He said, You've preached for 30 to 45 minutes about catching the wave of revival. Now, either you believe it or you don't. You either believe it or you don't. So I backed away, put the mic down, and God and I started having a conversation. I said, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And it's almost like God thinks that I'm stupid. And I said, God, what do you want me to do? And it's like God saying, well, duh. Invite people that need the Holy Ghost. 
See what I mean? We're so ingrained in certain things. When the service becomes about him and what he can do in our lives, things start changing. Brother Sean Ray, they start changing. And I said these words. I said, okay, here's what I need for you to do. How many need the baptism of the Holy Ghost here? And there were seven people that raised their hands. I'm glad you raised your hand because God's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost today, my friend. Seven people raised their hand. And I don't like embarrassing people. I've been there before. I've been called out. I don't like doing that. And I said, I don't mean to embarrass you. But I said, if you'll come up here and stand with me, if you need the Holy Ghost, I would appreciate it. And those seven people came up and stood right there in front. And they were all from the Spanish church. I don't know Spanish. They don't know English. But that's not a problem with God. Why? Because my God is more than enough. And I looked at them and I explained baptism to them. I explained repentance to them. And I told them, I said, let me tell you something right now. Nobody ever got the Holy Ghost without repenting first. And so what I did is I led an entire congregation of 400 into repentance. And we all repented, including the preacher. And when we got done repenting, but Scott, boy, I like saying that. I like saying, Brother Scott. Because I remember when he got the Holy Ghost not too many weeks ago standing right there. (laughs) Brother Scott, when I told them that, they need to repent and explain what repentance was to them. All of a sudden, tears started running down their face. They felt things that they had never felt in their entire life. And I turned around, I looked at the pastor of the Spanish church, the pastor of the English church. I said, I need some people to know how to pray people through the Holy Ghost. I don't want people just to get excited because somebody's crying. I need somebody who knows how to pray people through the Holy Ghost. Because that's the end result of this service. And Brother Tavares got up there and started speaking in Spanish. And all of a sudden, people started coming. And they stood in the back of these people. They stood in the front of these people. I said, now, don't start praying yet. And we get so excited that people don't know what's going on in their life. I wanted them to know what was getting ready to take place in their life. I wanted them to know that this power that we come in and we feel every Sunday morning, when we come in here Monday through Friday and we feel when we're still weary and still sleepy, on Wednesday night when we feel it in our homes or we come to Bible study, we feel it in Bible study is the power of the name of Jesus. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. And I said, hold on. I said, I want to explain what the Holy Ghost is before we start praying with people. And I explained what the Holy Ghost was, just like I did a few weeks ago here. And then I had them lift their hands. I said, I just want you to start saying, I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. However you do it, in Spanish or English, just start, just start loving God. And now I watched family standing on this side with a little boy. I watched a lady on this side bow over. I watched a lady right here that was Asian descent. She was crying. She didn't know what was going on. And, and, and we had five people get the Holy Ghost. By the time I got to the restaurant that night, a phone call came and said, remember that little Asian gal that was standing down there in the front? Well, she was sitting in the front row, and this gal went down and started talking to her. And all of a sudden, sitting there with nobody around her, she raised her hands. Now there was no pressure. And all of a sudden, she started speaking in other tongues as God gave her the utterance. <laughs> On Sunday morning, I preached a message, and the house was full of people. But there was one family that was there that was there for the first time. I'm not an evangelist. I'm a pastor. That's what I do. That's what God called me to do. But I looked back in the back corner right over here. And as I was given an altar call, the man had his hands raised. His wife was standing over there with her hands down like this. Somebody walked over to her and said, no, just raise your hand. As soon as she raised her hand, she started speaking in other tongues. 
just like that. Don't tell me that it's not for us. Don't tell me that it's not for you today. There's power in the name of Jesus when you understand what authority that you have when you use that name. A few weeks ago, Brother Dan Christensen stood right here behind this pulpit. When I was stuck in Las Vegas, literally stuck in Las Vegas, I couldn't get home. He called me. Because what you don't know is a story that was up here and the restoration that took place this time. You don't understand the brokenness of a man and his wife. And how he can preach a message like that. And you can only preach messages that you have experienced in your own life. And when he started preaching that message, there's many of you that came to him. And I'm so grateful for you to do that. But you came to him and you thanked him because he preached it out of such passion in his own life. Why? Because he has experienced it. And when you experience something like the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you've been baptized in Jesus' name, there's something that's more than just a name. You walk in that authority. You lay hands of healing down on individuals. You say prayers over individuals. God answers in His name. And you have that authority today. The Bible says we receive salvation in His name. Acts 4.12 Acts 2.38, Acts 19.5, and when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I close with this as we stand. In the book of Colossians, chapter 3 and verse 17, it says this, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. Do all in the name of Jesus. I don't have to go, I don't have time to go into it right now. But somebody, look, someone will look at us sometimes. I've had it happen besides just recently, thinking that we're Jesus only. That's not true. See me after church, I'll explain that to you. But I will tell you this, that when you are baptized in that name, there are things that take place in our life that we never reap the benefits of. We never reap the benefits of because we think it's just for the preacher. We think it's just for certain people in the church. But if you've been filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in his name, you walk in his authority today because there's power to save in the name of Jesus. There's an old song we sang when I was a boy called, In the name of Jesus, there's power to set you free. In the name of Jesus, you can walk in liberty over sin, disease, and sickness. There's power in that name. So here's what I'm going to do and how I'm going to end this service. If you need the Holy Ghost today, I want you to come and stand right here. I want you to come, my friend, stand right here. There's not going to be sermonettes for Christianettes. But if we're going to be the church, then we need to be the church. And it's not just coming from the platform. It needs to be the pew as well. Because when God speaks to you in that church service, he's not speaking to pastor. He's not speaking to anybody else. He's speaking to you at that point. To walk across an aisle and lay a hand on somebody, put an arm around somebody. Because if you don't do it, it may not get done that day, and they may not get what they need from God that day. So if you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I want you to come. I'm not going to take long. What's in a name? Here's what's in a name. Authority's in that name. Power's in that name. Healing is in that name. Deliverance is in that name. Divorce is dissipated in that name. Wayward children come home in that name. Come on. Come on. We've taken the name of Jesus for granted for a long time, and we don't use it to its full potential. But if you walk in that authority, God will use you in that authority. I've got grandkids that need the Holy Ghost. I've got grandkids that need the Holy Ghost. 
Where's Sister Chrissy at? There she is. Can I tell them what you just told me at shaking hands? That what you did? I think it's so cool. She has a niece. Need to get married. I don't know the niece. I don't know her from any from Adam, probably. But she had a relationship with her. And that niece said, I'd like for you to marry me. So she went online. <laughs> I think this is so cool. And she said, I went online and I got my my minister's license so I could marry her. And she got her minister's license and she performed the wedding. And some people go, Me? I just went, high five. High five. You're saying, you got to be kidding me. No. The last time I checked in the book of Acts, there was an individual by the name of Philip. And Philip was going by an Ethiopian eunuch. And he was in his fancy chariot reading and didn't know what he was reading. And Philip joined him in the chariot and said, you know what this is talking about? This is talking about being baptized. This is talking about being baptized in Jesus' name. And they said, here's water. What doth hinder us? Hey, guess what? Glad you asked. Here's water. What doth hinder us? A few weeks ago, we just baptized Sister Mary. She said, I want to change my life. It's my birthday month, and I want to change. There's not a better time to change. There's not a better time for children to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hear me? There's not a better time for kids to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There's not a better time for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, my friend. So I'm going to say this. How many kids are here that need the Holy Ghost? You got kids that are here that need the Holy Ghost. I want your moms and dads, I want you to bring them. They need the Holy Ghost. What you preach, you'll get. You preach the Holy Ghost, you'll get the Holy Ghost. So if there are children that are here this morning and you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I want you to come. If not, we're going to move on. I've got, th- I got four people down here who need the Holy Ghost. Four people. One of the things I loved about our evangelist that was here in the first part of July was that he made a connection with everybody in this church, from kids all the way up to seniors. And on a Sunday night, the last service he was here to preach for us, there were kids down in the front. And he was praying for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But here's something that I saw that made me equally as excited. It was a man by the name of Carolina and his wife, uh, uh, Alberta. When he saw those kids down there, Something happened on the inside of that man. And he was a quiet man sitting over here on the left-hand side, three rows from the front. He got out from where he was standing, walked down there. He was laying hands on these kids. I'd never seen him do that before. He was laying hands all over these kids and laying hands on people afterwards. I don't know if he has the Holy Ghost or not, but I will tell you this. Something took place in that service and that man's life And if something like that can take place in his life, something like that can take place in our life. The Holy Ghost is not something you should be afraid of. It's the Spirit of God coming inside of us, and we don't pray for the Holy Ghost. We pray for the Spirit of God. And we we don't, excuse me, I should restate that. We don't pray for tongues. We pray for the Holy Ghost. And the evidence that we have the Holy Ghost is that we speak in other tongues. So we don't pray for tongues. We pray, God, fill me with your Spirit. And I believe that Silas can get the Holy Ghost. I believe that my grandkids can get the Holy Ghost. I believe this gentleman right here can get the Holy Ghost. How many believe that this morning? Come on, you believe that this morning. Clap your hands. And I'm going to do exactly what I did when I was in Maryland because I feel led of the Holy Ghost to do it. We're all going to repent right now because you can't get the Holy Ghost without repenting. So here's what I want us to do. We're all going to repent. But here's what repentance is. Repentance, and I want the kids to listen to me right now. 
Repentance is being sorry for your sins. It's saying, God, I want you to forgive me of my sins. And not, I'm not going to do this no more. It's being a good boy and being a good girl. It's doing what mom and dad tell you to do. Repentance is walking away from the former life that we've had. And I got people up here crying right now. Tears running down their face. And so here's what I want us to do. I want us to do this right now. I want everybody in this house, however you want to do it, you can lift your hands, close your eyes, however you want to do it. But I want us all to repent right now. Jesus, we come before you right now. And we ask God that you would touch our lives, Lord. God, take out anything that's not like you. We repent this morning, Jesus. We're sorry for our sins, God. Lord Jesus, we ask right now, God, that you would reach down, Lord, and you'd forgive us because you said in your word, God, if we would come with you to you with an open heart, humble heart, God, you would in no wise cast anybody out. And I pray right now, Lord, that you would reach down, God, and you would touch each and every one of these individuals. Lord, the children that are here, my friend that's standing down here right now, Lord, I pray, God, that you would touch them. God, eradicate the sin that's in their life right now. Wash it away, I pray, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Now lift your voice and just thank God for just a moment of what he's done in all of our lives. We lift our voice to you, Lord, and we want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost, God. Thank you for touching us, God. There's power in your name, Lord. There's authority in your name. We walk in that name. There's healing in that name, Jesus.